thank you. Um, this week in particular has been quite telling about America's role in the Middle East region and the premise of America's military and political intervention in the Middle East. If you think about it, the United States has been vociferously and fiercely objecting to Russian military intervention in Syria, which is now five days or six days old. The United States, however, in the last year alone, has dropped 20,000 bombs over Syria and Iraq. The United States today has 800 military bases around the world that we know of. The United States also is deploying special forces in 135 countries that we know of. The classified bases, the secret missions, we don't, these are announced missions and bases around the world. The United States has raided Syria and Iraq in the name of fighting terrorism over 7,000 times in the last year alone. There is a whole number of people killed, not only ISIS, but also civilians in the course of this war. And yet, the United States decided that Russia, in the name of sovereignty and in the name of non-interference in affairs of countries, should not be interfering in Syria. This is an example of imperial hubris and the audacity of American imperial role in the Middle East region. In the time I have with me, I will speak for 50 minutes and then we'll have questions and answer. I will go over the premises and characteristic of US military intervention and foreign policy in the Middle East in the last 50 years or so. It has to be said that America's role has evolved, has substantially and dramatically increased in kind since the end of the Second World War. After the Second World War, the United States settled into a comfortable position of inheriting the colonial powers of France and Britain in the Arab East. But that was not all. In addition to wearing that mantle, the United States also was engaged in a bitter fight with the Soviet Union in the Cold War. The Cold War was a major, I mean, it took place in the arena of the Middle East as well as in other places. In the Middle East, the United States had a very clear advantage in that it controlled and bankrolled governments that were previously bankrolled and controlled by British and French colonial powers. So those became the clients of the United States and the United States was not going to do away with them unless popular upheavals, replacement and swept them aside which happened in several Arab countries, in Egypt, in Syria, in Britain, and several places there were almost successful attempts, but the United States intervened to protect, say, Gulf regimes, Oman in particular, there was a revolution in Oman for much of the 1970s, as well as, of course, in Jordan, which is a very important asset for both the United States and for Israel. Back then, of course, there was America's military engagement with Israel as well as with oil interests. We have to be very clear in delineating these lines. Israel was and remains a very important element in American regional strategy in the Middle East. Israel is not only an ally of the United States, a client of the United States, but it's also an assistant of American imperial designs. The, United, the Israel is an enforcer of American designs. In my own lifetime, I'm 55 years old, Israel has militarily intervened in the affairs of Morocco. They even assisted in the kidnapping and assassination of Mahdi bin Baraka. They have been involved in the affairs of Tunisia, not only bombing the country in the 1980s, but also their intelligence service was working very closely with the Tunisian Secret Service in order to spy on the Palestinian Liberation, liberation Organization. Uh, the Israelis were, of course, involved in sabotaging the Libyan government when it used to be working, for the working in supporting a Palestinian organization, but for its own purposes, of course, uh, let's not be mistaken about it. And most importantly, Israel was part of the Camp David regional order. After the death of Nasser, America and Israel built a regional order 
that would basically be subject to Israeli American diktats. This regional order succeeded in breaking Egypt away from the Arab front back then that was planning in name or in deed for the liberation of Arab lands, if not all of Palestine. Egypt was taken away from that front. And not only that, the Israelis worked very closely in securing the Egyptian dictatorial regime. In Jordan, as you all know, Israel saved the Jordanian monarch more than once. They continue to do that probably on a regular weekly basis. Uh, in the case of the Gulf, the relationship for much of the contemporary history was rather under the table. The Saudis, let us not forget, worked very closely with the Israelis in the 1960s. I have uh, documented that on my blog, and there are now new documents about the Israeli role, uh, along with the Saudis, in supporting the reactionary forces of the Yemeni imamate back in the 1960s. Make no mistake about it. These alliances are not as sectarian as they appear today or as they wish us to see them as. In the mid-1960s, the Saudi royal family, as sectarian as it is in its Wahhabi doctrine, was aligning itself with the Zaydi Shiite imamate, just as it is today aligning itself with against, uh, I mean, against the Houthi uh, Zaydi forces inside Yemen. But make no mistake about it. Israel, the United States, and Saudi Arabia always, if there is a war going on, if there's a conflict going on, they support the most reactionary side of that conflict. Uh, this is why many Arabs look with apprehension at America's intervention. Even if there is a lousy regime, if America is working against it and Saudi Arabia and Israel, they always invariably will support a regime or an opposition movement that is worse than what we have. I mean, look at Syria, for example. Here is a tyrannical regime that no one in the right mind can praise or can applaud. But on the other hand, the United States and the Gulf countries succeeded, managed to produce to us ISIS and the official Syrian branch of Al-Qaeda and Nusra Front. I mean, of course, they mentioned there are some moderate forces because we don't want to forget there are four to five. We still are not sure of the number. There are four to five missing Syrian, moderate Syrian rebels that are floating around the country of Syria that were trained by the CIA, but that have basically ended their project to liberate Syria under American patronage. Uh, we don't know the number because, as you remember, the head of US Central Command, when asked about the various Syrian rebels that the CIA was training uh, to fight in Syria against America's enemies, uh, he said that, in fact, the truth is most of them abandoned, uh, co I mean, converted to the Nusra terrorist fronts, or basically went home. Uh, four to five of them remain. And uh, if you believe in New York Times, they probably are on their way to control all of Syria on their own, four of them, or five. Uh, so the Middle East region has changed. America has more interest than it had. Uh, oil was a big factor, but let us be clear about oil. Oil was not, I mean, oil used to be a big factor, and America is very keen on controlling these natural resources. But American import of Saudi oil now is not what it used to be. It is now close to 10%. The United States gets more of its oil from Venezuela, from Canada, and now we have shale oil, uh, shale oil and various other resources that were not available before. So for that reason, there is an exaggeration of America's interest in oil. However, Saudi Arabia and Gulf countries are still very important American economic strategy because no, they don't provide America with oil, but they provide something important. One, they determine, by virtue of overpumping or underpumping, Saudis are able to basically uh, increase the production in order to lower the prices. And they always do that when an American president is running for re-election as a favor to that president. They also, if there is a need, they would increase uh, the price of oil if it's in America's interest. But notice they do that, the Saudi royal family, with total disregard to their own interests, and of course to the interests of their own people. But of course, since when these royal families care about their own people. But even their own interests, they are willing to do that for America's bidding. And in fact, 
If you look at America's documents from the 70s and the 80s, you will find oil was a big factor in discussion in diplomatic meetings between the Americans and their Gulf counterparts. How do we know that? Well, if you remember, this Iranian student after the revolution took over the American embassy. And if you remember, they shredded all these documents. But the shredders back then used to uh, tear the papers in a vertical way, not the way they are. The technology of uh, shredders changed after the takeover of the embassy, by the way. So Iranian students diligently for years assembled these shredded documents like jigsaw puzzles and published them in 100 volumes. Uh, they are not easy to find, but if you are really that curious, they have them at the UC Berkeley Library. And if you read those documents, you will find oil was a big factor. However, the Cold War ended, the United States declared itself victorious, celebration hasn't even ended. However, after the end of the Cold War, America's uh, designs and ambitions became quite unmasked. I mean, I know it sounds Napoleonic, but it's fair to say the major objective of the United States in the Middle East today is nothing short of world domination. The United States under Democrat, Republican, Obama, Bush, all these are superficial cosmetic changes, is aiming at world domination. In that goal, the Middle East figures very prominently. Why? For several reasons. One. The Arab people are stubbornly opposed to America's foreign policy and wars and designs. They are not as easy to subjugate. However, that necessitates on the part of the United States the creation and preservation of tyrannical regimes throughout the Middle East. I mean, what is hilarious about American foreign policy and its rhetoric is that whenever they speak about democracy and human rights and the need for democracy in the Middle East, they are only talking about two regimes. You realize that, right? They're talking about Syria and Iran. The United States only talk about Syria and Iran. The, the assumption is all the other dictatorships are actual democracies. And these are, and, and, and the thing is, if Syria and Iran were to switch and become allies, they attain that glorious label that America accords to dictatorship of the Middle East. And that's being called moderate Arab allies, moderate Arab regimes. I mean, what are you going to call them? You know, gardens of democracy and uh, oasis of freedoms? You can't do that. So they give them this label of moderate Arab regimes. In the, in the sense of world domination by the United States, the United States is not going to allow any rival power to basically assert itself or compete with the United States. These are not my words. This is actually what the United States said in its document in 2002 uh, published by the National Security Council, published in 2002, uh, called National Security Strategy for the United States. And in it, the United States is quite clear in its stated goal that no power, big or small, will be allowed to compete with the United States, China or Russia or any of these places. Towards that end, the United States is not allowing any rivalry with its own power in the Middle East region the Russian or the Chinese will be basically marginalized if they attempt. This is why the United States was taken aback by the Russian intervention because it was against the rules of the game that the United States established after the Gulf War of 1991.